It's our pleasure today to have Kelly Andrisse here, who will tell us about the latest news on bonded the Brega. Uh, please, Kilian, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll present uh, bonded the yeah, unbounded debt proofs for taking from us on the grid to revisit it. I will present you this paper. Uh, this is joint work with one of my advisors, uh, Johan Hosta. Okay, so just like to get everyone on the same page, right? We do proof complexity. So, what is proof complexity? Well, we study certificates of unsatisfiability. They're also known as proofs of unsatisfiability or refutations, and I'll use these words interchangeably. If it's confusing, please interrupt me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the main question is, if you're given an unsatisfiable Boolean formula, can this be certified? Sure, you can. You can just check every assignment and then check that it's really not uh, satisfiable. Uh, but I mean, the more interesting question is, can you do this efficiently? And how large are such certificates in general? And I mean, yeah, as we all know, this is a question of how, how NP and co-NP are related. And as such, we don't really expect this to prove this anytime soon. So in order to actually prove proper like lower bounds on certificate lengths, uh, we have to focus on, uh, on like- There's something wrong with the video now. I will wait. Sorry. Uh, do you have video now, that. Susanna? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so yeah, anyway, uh, we focus on concrete proof systems, and today we will focus on bounded depth breaking. And so let us just start uh, introducing the Frege proof system. So a Frege refutation of a CNF uh, on n variables is a sequence of lines. Can we move this stuff out of the way? I mean, I cannot see my own slides. Sorry. Yeah, you can, I think you can just right click it from the time. Yeah. And then move it up or whatever. This you can definitely, I think that will disappear when you. Okay, so at least I can see myself. Okay, sorry about this. So, so right, a Frege refutation of the CNF on n variables is a sequence of lines where each line is a Boolean formula, and we choose the basis or and not. But this is rather arbitrary, and like, for like, just like in all my pictures, I also have ends, and we understand that this is just a shorthand for like not or not. Okay, and then each line. Is either a clause that is already in our original formula or it has been derived from previous lines by some derivation. And we'll, I'll tell you what the derivation rules are. These are these five. Uh, it's not very important what these are precisely by a result of uh, Brekhoff and, uh, and Cook, but let us just cover them really quick. So, so on the left side here, we have the P or not P. You can always derive this for any formula. Then if we have derived the formula P, then we can weaken this. So we can write P or Q for any other formula Q. If we have P or not P, a P or P, then we can simplify this to just P. And then we can uh, like shift around the brackets, like if you just have ORs. And the last one is really the interesting one, which is like the cut rule, right? Which is just a resolution, like in more general form, right? So we have Q or P and not P or R. And we basically resolve over P and we can conclude Q or R. Okay, so, so this is the Frege system that we work with, but again, like the precise rules are not that important. And also the basis that we choose is not that important. And yeah, and the goal is in the end to like derive the constant forms. Good, because yeah, then because these rules are sound, we see that the, the CNF is not satisfied. Okay. Uh, just some terminology that I'll use throughout the talk. So that we have length is the number of lines in the proof. The line size is the maximum size of any formula occurring in the proof. And the depth of the proof is just the maximum depth of any formula. And this is the logic depth, I guess, or something like this it's called. So, so we just count the number of alternations in ORs and NOTs. Okay. Good. And like a major open problem in proof complexity is to prove actually super polynomial lower bounds for this uh, Frege proof system, uh, for, for a CNF. 
And I, I think I'm a bit pessimistic and I do not think that we'll prove this anytime soon. So, so what we do instead is somehow we limit our proof system further and namely we only consider proofs where every formula in the proof is bounded in that, right, by that D. And this is the D bounded that really. And this is the proof system that we will start. Okay, so this is the proof system. And now I also have to introduce you. Ah, oh, yeah, and sorry, just to like demonstrate the issue, like going into low depth is that like formulas may blow up. But okay, good. So, so, but we have now the proof system. And next I have to introduce you the formula that we'll be working with. And this is the Zetian formula. So, so it's a CNF, which is defined over connect the graph G. Uh, we have Boolean variables associated with each edge, and each vertex claims that an all number of edges is set to once, one or set to true incident to, to this vertex. So for example, this is a satisfying assignment to this graph, and this is an unsatisfying assignment because the two vertices on the right-hand side have two edges incident that are both set to true or to one. Okay, so it's not so hard to show that this formula is actually satisfiable if and only if the number of vertices is even. Uh, and so therefore we'll consider like this formula defined over an odd number of vertices because otherwise well, you can satisfy it. not so interesting. And more precisely, we'll actually consider this uh, formula over the two-dimensional n by n torus, which can be depicted like this. And this is annoying to draw. And yeah, so so, so you can also draw it like this, in, in, right? Where, where you have basically the grid with edges wrapping around, but still this is, Annoying to draw, and I'll just drop the like wrapping around edges, and I'll draw the grid, and it's understood that we're really working over the n-band torus. Okay, this is the taking formula, and then I just want to mention also quickly the pigeonhole principle because we also have a lower bounds for the pigeonhole principle. And so, what does this CNF claim? It claims that n plus one pigeons fit into n holes. We have a Boolean variable for each pair of pigeon and holes. And if it's set to true, then we think of the pigeon going to that hole. Uh, we have axioms claiming that each pigeon goes into at least one hole, and axioms that claim that each hole can be occupied by at most one pigeon. And so clearly, if you have n plus one pigeons and n holes, then it's not satisfied. Okay, so these are like somehow the two formulas or two nice CNFs that we have lower ones for. So let us just cover what is known. So. Uh, what we know about like super polynomial bounded depth Frege, lower bounds. So, so this started with the work of Aitai, who showed that up to like some growing function in N, like, like you can take this depth to be slightly growing in, in N, and then you can prove lower bounds. Uh, and then, then this has been cleaned up and, and improved by Velatoni, uh, Pitassi, and uh, I'm blanking. Wokuhar, I believe. Being and, potassium, no? Being well, well, maybe I'm mistaken. Well, sorry about this. So, so but they showed it that you can get it up to log star of n, which is still very weak. And then okay, yeah, sure. they came these two amazing papers uh, by Krajcik, Kudlak, and, and Woods, or Watson, Woods, Woods yeah. I believe. And then also uh, by Pitassi, Beam, and Ipagliazzo. Who, who showed that the pigeonhole principle is hard up to that log log. But this is basically where we're stuck with the pigeonhole principle. And after this, all, all these like amazing papers, like somehow there has also been interest in studying the second formula. And so Ben Sasson and later Wokerhard and Fu, they showed that you can also get this up to that log log n. And this is basically where we were stuck for a long time until this paper by Pitassi, uh, Rossman, Servadio, and Tan in 2016 came out, who claimed that you can actually get uh, super polynomial bounded depth Frege lower bounds up to depth square root log n. Uh, and I mean, this is a major improvement over the previous log log n. Right? So, so I think this is quite cool. And, and then it was followed up by Hostad, uh, who, who, who strengthened it even further, like to basically optimal like log n over log log n. And um, yeah. Okay, so this is where we are. So, so let us just look quickly at the theorem of Hostad. So he showed really that over this uh, torus, uh, any Frege refutation of that, of that T requires proofs that are size exponential in n to the one over the AT. And we believe that 
this is optimal because if you would get a significant improvement on, on the dependence on D, then you would actually get super fun on the regular one. Uh, so, you know, my feeling was at least two years ago that everything is done. There is nothing to do anymore. But then Pitasi Ramakrishna and Tan came along last year and asked, well, we could also restrict the size of each line, right? Not just the depth of each formula, but also the size of each formula occurring. Can we prove something better? And they actually showed that you can. So, so they showed that if you restrict the depth as well as the line size of every formula occurring in your proof, so we have depth D and line size capital M, then proofs have to be of length exponential in N divided by two to the D times square root log N. Now, I think this is a bit hard to parse. So, so let me just give you like one example setting of parameters. So, so if we set M to be poly N, so, so each line uh, is of size only like polynomial in N, then this lower bound is like almost exponential in N up to D little over square root log N. Whereas like Hostad's lower bound is if the form exponentially little of one as soon as D starts growing. Okay. Yes. So this is much, much stronger uh, like lower bounds. So that's really nice. But I mean, is this the end of the story and they conjecture? No, they claim that actually we should be able to get like this uh, depth size trade off or whatever you want to call it. We, we should be like exponentially in N divided by log N to the D. Yeah, and this is where our results fit in. Uh, so our main theorem is basically resolving this conjecture, and then we show that indeed such uh, proofs require size expansion and divided by log n to the And just like to show you how, how these parameters improve. So, so instead of uh, having polynomial line size, we can now go to quasi-polynomial line size. In the depth we can push a bit further up to log n over log log n. And we still get this almost exponential in n. Okay. And while proving this theorem, we somehow revisit uh, Johann, Johann's previous proof or Hostad's previous proof, and then we show we we actually proved that theorem, uh, which was like exponential in n to the one over fifty eight d to exponential in n over one over two d. Okay, where I'm hiding some polylog. This is probably still not optimal. It's probably still off by a factor of two in the exponent of the exponent, but I do believe it's a significant improvement. Okay, so these are the results. Any questions? Anything? Nothing. Good. So we know that unbounded trigger can do state inefficiently, I guess. Well, extended Frege, you can definitely, I'm not sure it has been written for Frege. I suspect so. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, as far as I know, this has not been written anywhere, but it, I think it should be true. I'd be surprised if it is. Okay. So, yeah. So, I'll cover a few proof ideas. Uh, I'll yeah, I'll start with with uh, with uh, with just the normal switching lemma or like these normal uh, length lower bounds or size lower bounds, and then later on just quickly tell you what you have to do in order to get this uh, restriction in depth as well as length. Okay, okay. So right, we we are given like a sequence of, of low, low depth formulas, and I mean it's not so surprising that that we will want to build on techniques that have been developed for uh, proving circuit lower bounds in, in the bounded depth side. So, so, so let me just like really quickly like recap how we prove these lower bounds. So suppose we're given a small circuit like of depth D and it computes parity on n bits. So, so how do we show that this is not possible? Well, we hit C with a random restriction, which keeps uh, like uh, with probability P, it keeps each variable alive and otherwise assigns it zero or one. Uniformly at random. And then we argue that the circuit shrinks in depth by one. And like if we apply these d times, then we're left with a circuit that is constant. And on, on the other hand, we still have hopefully the function which is non constant, so we get contradiction. And then essentially, what we use for this is a switching lemma. So let me quickly tell you what a switching lemma is. So, so 
given a DNF formula of bounded bottom fanion, we want to hit this DNF with a restriction so that we get end up with a CNF uh, with bounded bottom fanion. And clearly that there is like sometimes there's failure if, if you're unlucky. And this is so the, the main game is somehow to analyze this failure probability and bound it. And uh, the classic result by Hostad showed in the 80s that this failure probability can be bounded by a type PT to the S. Okay. And so just like a few pictures on how we apply this. So, so what we do is we start with this uh, depth D circuit, right? We look at the bottom two or three depth. We, we have some DNFs there. We hit it with a restriction, we get CNFs, and then we can collapse these layers and then we continue doing this. And like we can switch from CNF to DNF and DNF to CNF. And then, then we continue doing this. Okay, so now how do we apply this machinery to Frege proofs? Well, right, we start with the Frege refutation and we want to hit it with a restriction. And hopefully, we somehow want to argue that, that the depth of every line shrinks by one. And in addition to, to, to the circuit setting, what we really have to take care of is, is to, to make sure that our formula does not suddenly become ref, like contradiction. It should like somehow remain the same formula or at least a, a hard formula, right? So, so what we really want to do is like we want to start with the torus uh, on n by n vertices and then go to a torus on m by m vertices. Okay. And this requires this careful uh, choice sigma. And uh, yeah, hopefully with the switching lemma, we can do this. Now, I do not fully understand whether you can actually carry out this proof outline, but somehow like one issue that carrying this out seems to be like to argue that you still have a proof, particularly if you get into low depth. But I, I'm not sure, I have to admit, but there is like a different very, uh, a very uh, nice way to, to get lower bounds. So let us like quickly like explain how, how we really prove these lower bounds. Okay. So, so we have a slightly different approach. So, so what we want to say is that lines we, which have been derived in, in few steps are, are somehow still satisfiable. Okay. And clearly this is not possible because you can derive initial CNF and this is not satisfying. But, but what we can hope to prove is somehow that under partial assignments, we, we, we are still somewhat uh, satisfied. Or, uh, we're, yeah. And then, I mean, this is sufficient to, to argue that we have never reached contradiction in some sense. So what, what I will claim now is that there is an empty, non-empty family of small partial assignments so that no Satin axiom is falsified under them. And if you are given an, an uh, a small partial assignment in this family, you can actually extend it to any variable. Okay. And we also want that it's close under subs. So, so let me like somehow try to explain what these uh, assignments are. And somehow we'll want to work with these assignments. So if you're given like this huge grid and you, you ask me some variable, like, like this variable here in the middle. Well, I mean, there is no constraint there, right? I can just answer one or zero. It really doesn't matter. So that just answer one. Okay. Let us just answer one as long as we can. I mean, you can continue asking var variables around this vertex, and I'm somehow like not constrained. But now I have to pay a bit of attention because I have to make sure that I satisfy this one safety max, right? So, so I have to answer zero. And we can continue doing this. And somehow we don't run into trouble until we arrive in a situation like this. And someone queries this green edge here. Why? Because this will split the, the graph of, of variables that, that have not been queried into two. And we really have to make sure that we don't run into contradiction on this small part, right? So we will want to pick the correct parity on this green edge so, so that contradiction cannot be found in this purple part, namely that we still have an assignment on, on this purple part. And this can always be done. And then, I mean, if you do this, like somehow we, we get this family of of assignments that are non-contradicting at any point, as long as you stay like in low size of these local assignments. Okay. Good. Okay. So so we are given this this somehow this family of assignments, and now 
I, I want to give each line a decision tree uh, that, that somehow decides this line for any of these partial assignments. Okay. So somehow it should output zero if you if you really violate the, the line and one otherwise. Like, yeah. And clearly, like the axioms are then associated with the one tree because this family is just locally consistent. Uh, and then the hope is somehow by a soundness of Rega that, that all lines in, in a short group are still associated with the one tree. I'm not 100% sure whether this is correct intuition, but this is how I understand it. Anyway, and this is basically what you do. So, so, so we, for each sub formula uh, occurring in our proof, we'll associate it with, with a decision tree so that true and false, like the constants, are really the one tree and the zero tree. So, so right? Uh, I mean, yeah, you really, it should be truthful in the sense. Uh, on the other hand, and variables are associated with the corresponding left one decision tree. Uh, if you have a formula and the negation of a formula, we somehow want to get the same answers, but just negated. So we're a bit more restrictive and we just say that, well, we want the same decision trees, but the answers are just negated. They're like just split. And then if we have a formula, which is the or of some sub formulas, then we want that this decision tree somehow respects this or. And how, how do we mean this? Well, if you look at any branch and you answer one in, in this decision tree for F, then we want that really there is an I, so the decision tree associated with these smaller subformulas F I also answers one. That's somehow like the or is respected by these decision trees. And conversely, like if, if you answer zero, then you really want that all decision trees associated with these subformulas also answer zero. Okay. So we want decision trees of this form over like A. So I really want that every branch in this decision tree is in A. This means that all decision trees are, are, are below that. Okay. So just to clarify, when you say a decision tree for A, you know, uh, every leaf of the decision tree belongs to Yes, I want every leaf to be in A. Like it. It's a decision tree over A, I, I don't know, or for A, I don't know how to say this. Like, I really want to stay in this family. I never want to go outside. And because this family is like, has only local assignments, I somehow, like this decision tree has to be a small family. And somehow, I mean, if you start, for instance, querying all variables around a parity constraint, then somehow when the decision tree gets to the final variable, which is already fixed, it somehow says, no, no, don't ask that. I already know what that is. Yeah, somehow, we are, or how should we think yeah, about we this? Yeah, we know that all, all, all assignments will never go the wrong way. So, so, so this is like a forced variable. So, so just don't query it. Like, yeah, very good. I mean, if you want to start with a decision tree, which is not over assignments for A, well, just walk down the decision tree. And if you ever encounter a, a branch which would lead to a local or just to some inconsistency, you just remove the choice and then continue with the subgraph where you don't have this issue. Okay. Yeah, and, and then, uh, yeah, I think like maybe I should mention that these uh, evaluations these were introduced by uh, Kai Chichik, good luck and Woods, Woods, it's not Watson, it's Woods, and uh, Workaround and Foo have precisely this definition. And then what you can show is that somehow that this is really true that, that, that lines are associated with the one tree uh, as you go through the proof, uh, if you have these A evaluations. Okay. So, so if you have a proof which has these associated A evaluations, which means you have this construct here, then really every line of the proof is mapped to a one tree. Did you sorry? Did you say what a one tree is? A one tree is a non-trivial tree, but every leaf in it is labeled by a one. Yeah, it's just any tree where you only have one answer. You don't have any zero answers. Yes, true. Yes, good. Okay. And yeah, I mean, it's yeah, this is not so hard to show. It's yeah. okay. You just go over all the rules and. You just do by induction on the left. 
but but, but this tree it depends on a right or yes what? yes what, what is the question or i mean you want these locally consistent assignments and you really want to only stay in these assignments you don't want to go to assignments that could false really falsify it but step one would be like trying to replace it. Step one is to, to think really long and hard. And then we figure out the beautiful set calligraphic A of, of nice assignments. That's like already step one to come up with this construction. And step two would then be to do this lemma that somehow once I have this A, this family of assignments A, and if the Frege refutation is in sufficiently low depth or something, then I can sort of inductively show that as each new line comes along, I'm still good. I have a decision tree of the right form for this line. Yes, I mean, yeah, you, we still we we always have a decision tree, but you want to show that inductively it's always a one tree. But clearly, the axioms is just satisfied by this calligraphic A because we set it up so that it's not contradicting. And then you have to make sure that, that all the larger assignments to A are still not contradicting, but this is really just this worrying about subgraphs that get closed off and that you could get local contradictions. And do you want to say something already now about, I mean, the tricky case seems to be the big aura, yes? Yeah, 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 don't jump ahead. Uh, don't, don't, because I mean, what don't. if what if neither case applies? Yeah, like... yeah, yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay. So, so. Okay, but what, what we have to remember is like these decision trees should be of low depth because our assignments, calligraphic A, these are only like small local assignments. We are not allowed to leave this set of assignments. Okay. Good. So, so, so what is our actual proof outline? So, so we want to create an A evaluation for a short refutation. And we do this by induction on, on the depth of all subformulas occurring in the proof. Okay. So clearly, like a base case, these are constants and variables. This is easy. We know how to do this. And now we want to do this inductive step where we have A evaluations for all subformulas of depth at most i, and we want to get it for formulas of depth i plus one. Okay. Two cases. Either f is of the form not g, right? But this is easy. Just take the decision tree for g and negate the answers, and we're fine. And the other case is the case that Jacob already mentioned. It's like if we have an or of some some guys, okay. So and as I said, like this calligraphic A consists of partial assignments, and we really want to have these these shallow decision trees. I mean, you can just build the naive decision tree, but it will like get really deep, and we we don't want that because we want to stay in this calligraphic A. Set. But the main idea here is to use a switching lemma for this, right? If if while we build this A evaluation in each, like when we increase our depth, we, we do one switching, then hopefully this R of these other decision trees will actually now turn out to be a low depth decision tree. Okay. I don't know whether it's made any sense, but so so what, what I said before, the switching lemma does is it switches from DNF to CNF, but in fact, what it does, it, it, it switches a DNF into, into a low depth decision tree. And, and I mean, here you can already, this is already enough, but, but what you really can think of is that we have an R of like low depth decision trees, and we can switch this into a decision tree of depth at most S. Okay. And again, you have this failure probability, which depends on, on the initial depth of these decision trees, the final depth of these decision trees. The, the size of the initial grid and the size of the grid that we end up with. So is it correct to say that your switching lemma is in fact slightly stronger? I mean, before you were only asking for a for a CNF formula, but now if you're getting a low depth decision tree, then you know that has more structure. I mean, you could write like, then you know you can write it as a as a small CNF also as a small DNF. Yeah, I mean, but I mean the original switching lemma already gave you a yeah. stronger thing. But we we want the stronger thing. We will use it. You will use it? Yes, because this is how we will build our decision trees, right? OK. And the second question is, when we're doing, you said we're doing this by induction over the formulas? Yeah, over do all we, the formulas in the proof. 
do we care that it's all sub formulas in the proof only or like are you actually looking at the proof as it were when you do this or are you just taking no, 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 any no. set of formulas of small depth no, no, no. we're looking at the, pr the proof and, and because the proof is small we know that we have few sub formulas and that which allows us to do like the union bound over the probability of failure in, in the switching depth. okay but you're okay so you're looking at the proof in a very very restricted sense no sort of in the sense that well okay no I mean, you want to find no. a restriction which is good for for this set of clauses and yeah. a, for this set of sub formulas and then you, yeah you just show oh, there exists one by you yeah. know because yeah so no, i guess you do look at it otherwise there is a resolution for something from the instruction it's definitely i didn't understand i mean if you do not have restriction on the proof size then there is no hope you can find a successful assignment. Ah, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. Yeah, there is huge the, yes, resolution. Yes, you can, yeah, yes. I, yeah, I guess what I was asking was something slightly different, but it's kept taking, I mean, you can sort of, you can look at the proof in different details. Somehow you can just say, okay, I'll look at the proof, it's at most this large, then I'll do something completely independent of the proof, a random, like some kind of construction, and then by arguing just about the size of the proof and nothing else, for some random choice, this will work. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like this is what yes. we're going to do. Yes. I mean, there are other types of lower bounds where you actually somehow really look at the proof and this sort of, you go by induction over the proof and build your adversarial strategy. And this we will not need to do, it seems. I guess not. No? Yeah. Okay, good. But again, we have the failure probability and we want to analyze this and then the smaller failure probability we can show the better our Okay, so the original proof was Hostad had this failure probability, which was bounded by s to the 27t, scattered m over n to the omega s. Uh, don't, don't worry so much about this expression, but like as we dis just discussed, we want to do a union bound over all subformulas occurring in the proof. So we really want this term to be less than one over the size of pi of our original reputation. Okay. And this somehow forces us to choose s logarithmic in the size of the proof and t is equal to s we can think of and this somehow requires then that m is fairly small like, like it has to like counter this s to the 27 if we want this to be less than one over the size of time okay will you so, remind so, us what m and s is here yeah, yeah. so, so t and s is the is the depth of the decision tree and n is the original dimension of the thing. Uh, instance and n is the, the the resulting from the restriction to to which one we we switch to. So so, so somehow like this s to twenty seven forced us to choose n fairly small and, and like cause this like bad number in the second exponent. And uh, yeah, so so the first improvement of our proof is somehow that we replace this dependence on s by a logarithm in n, and this then allows us to get. Uh, the size lower bound, which is essentially exponentially in n to the one. Okay. We'll cover the proof of the switching lemma in some detail in, in the second hour of this seminar. And um, yeah, but that's somehow all that I want to say. And this is like really how, how the proof works. So, so we boiled it all down to like somehow this switching lemma. Do you have questions? Many, I hope. And so what will happen now is that you'll argue by induction over the depth and every time you need to raise your depth by one you're going to shrink the grid size mm -hmm. and as you explain how these parameters play with each other and now you win if at the end you still have a grid of non-trivial size somehow now you because now you have built this you've succeeded in building your calligraphic set a not for the original formula but for this multiple time restricted formula which is still a contradictory setting formula but apparently and the proof would of course have been maintained under restrictions but it's not proving contradiction and hence your original reputation was also too good to be true Basic proof. Okay. But I mean, yeah, it's important to say this is not our proof. Value. 
this, as I understand, comes from the project of Grandfields. And we, we just put a new switching path. Okay. Good. So, so uh, line size versus length trade off, like, like this. Yeah. So, so, right, we want to prove this. Uh, our main theorem that trigger uh, is imitation of the Taken formula over, over this torus uh, of depth D and line size M uh, are length expansion in N divided by log M. So yeah, I so like uh, Pitazzi, Ramakrishnan, and Tan like crucially observed that you can use or observe this, this is a weak word proved <laughs> that you can use multi switching to prove these kind of trade offs for free game, and they slightly generalized th these ev evaluations that we just saw, saw, which is not not so important for this part of the proof, but this also goes into their paper. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, at least to me, it's far from obvious that you can use multi-switching to, to, to get these trade-offs. Like multi-switching was originally devised to, to get these correlation bounds for circuits, to say that parity is not just hard for low depth circuits to compute exactly, but even like, like having some correlation with parity is difficult as long as you have small circuits, okay? So, so I, I just want to tell you what, what, what the, multi-switching lemma is, and I don't think I'll cover the proof of this because it builds on the switching lemma, which is already a multiple lemma. Yes. So is it clear what would be the, like the, if, if we believe in, and this is exploring anal analogies between proof complexity and circuit complexity, the circuits not even having correlation, could you somehow view your result as, as having slightly buggy proof systems that make sort of conclusions that are correct most of the time, but even like semi-buggy proofs, no, I don't think. doesn't translate. Also, if this is, yeah, I mean, this is not ours. This is Pitassi and Krishna. They figured out this connection. Yeah, yeah no, no, I'm, but I'm, ask, I'm asking about just yeah. the interpretation, like going between circuit complexity and if there's any, like this correlation thing, can you say anything in, Proof complexity that would be that, but it's not buggy derivations. No. No, 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 no. no it's just low depth and low line size. No, no, no mistakes made. Everything is true. Okay, so let me just tell you what the multi switching lemma does. So right, we we have this switching lemma which switches uh, DNF into into a low depth decision tree, and then we had to do somehow a union bound over all DNFs occurring, right, and, and then. We would get something. And we want to do something better. Namely, what we want to do is we want to consider multiple DNFs at once and then create a decision tree for these and somehow beat the union bound, get something better. Okay. So, 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 how, what, what, what could you switch this to? Well, we start with n DNFs. And, and what we want to is we want to obtain a partial decision tree, which all these formulas on the left side share. Okay. So, so we have a large part of the decision tree, which is the same for all these, these DNFs, okay? And then for each DNF has then hanging off this common decision tree, has like small decision trees, so that when you compose these to this decision tree with the hanging off part, then you get actually a decision tree which decides the DNF, okay? And right, this the, the lower part really depends on, on what DNF you look at. And yeah, I, I guess you get the picture. So yeah, so so now you again analyze this and you try to bound the failure probability. And now you collect the parameters. Well, you have T, which is like the bottom panel of your DNF, S, which is the depth of the common decision tree. Then L is the small parts hanging off the common decision tree. N the original dimension of the Satin formula and N the resulting one and capital N is all formulas that we consider. And you should think of all sub formulas that we consider on one line. We consider somehow one line together. And we can show that we can bound this by this, the following probability. So, so, so essentially it's this N to the S over L factor, which is due to the setup of, of how we prove these things. And then it's really the same expression as you get for the single switching. Okay. So, so it's really like, essentially we take the proof of the single switching lemma, 
we do some minor modifications and then you get a multi switch. So, so, so yeah, I, no, not minor changes. But there are, yeah, it's important what you do. That. But anyway, okay. So is it important to, or or does it, do we want to think about how these parameters play with each other? So somehow, obviously the larger you make L, the easier it will, it will be to get this, because I mean, if you make L to be everything, then you're back to the original setting and there's no common part. And L is used to kill the big M, but the S part is still used to, it's, it's looking like it's, playing the part of the previous switching lemma? I mean, the parameters change in every switching. I, um, let me see. Um, no, I, yeah, I think I, 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 I'm not comfortable telling. I can tell but the settings up. will, okay, that's already information. So you're saying as, as you collapse your depths, you're going to tune these in a careful way. Not in a careful way. You just set it up once and then it works, but like, the setting of parameters in the previous demo is much easier, at least for me. Okay. So, so okay, good. So, so, so this was multi-switching lemma. I do not want to talk about this anymore. Uh, no, I don't understand how to explain any further details of the multi-switching lemma unless we covered the single switching lemma. I think this is already a lot for one second. Okay, and, and so, so, but what I want to tell you now is what this restriction is. And I think this is, <laughs> this restriction was crafted by, by uh, Hostad and, and it's really pretty. And I think, uh, yeah, one should at least understand how, how this restriction works. Okay, so we use the same restrictions as Hostad did and Pitassi, Ramakrishna and Tan use also the same restriction. Okay, so, so first I want to tell you what form this restriction has. So, so yeah, what does it look like? So, so we start with this larger grid, torus, even though I draw a grid, and we want to end up with this smaller torus, okay? And we'll have an affine restriction. What does this mean? This means that either a variable of the original instance, these are the X variables, is met to constant one or zero, or to a new variable or the negation of a new variable, okay? So, so let us look at an example. So here next to every original edge, I, I write the, variable that it is mapped to by sigma, okay? So, so I'm claiming this would be an example of an affine restriction as, as we'll encounter it in, in the switching lemma. So why is this a nice restriction? Well, if you look at all vertices that are not in, in, the, in, in the blue, in the smaller grid, then we see that the taking actions there are all satisfied, right? So, so we can forget about them, right? And then if we look at, at vertices, which are not gonna be new centers of, of, this, of this blue grid, we'll see that no matter how you assign the Y variables, this will also be satisfied. So, so basically we can forget about these vertices as well, as long as we ensure that we get these Boolean variables, like yeah, Boolean values. Right? And then finally, like, like if you look at, at the vertices that survive, you, you can check that this actually is again a taking constraint. Or we just like substitute somewhere else. So, so if we have a restriction of this form, then we can really like somehow do this step from, from a large grid to a smaller grid. Torus. Okay, so this is somehow the form of the restriction, but I haven't told you how, how to choose this restriction. Right? So, so how do we choose this restriction? Well, we want to end up with this grid. And I mean, you could imagine just picking any subgrid. But then if you do this, you have a lot of dependencies be between which vertex you chose here, like the effects which vertex you can chose there. And, and this seems to be hard to analyze. So what Hostad suggested was to split this torus into, into separate regions. And I'll promise you, I'll pick one vertex from each of these regions, okay? And in fact, we'll just have some candidate vertices. They're gonna be the alive vertices, these blue vertices. And I promise you that I'll pick one of these blue vertices from every grid. So, so the, yes, so, so we'll choose one of these blue vertices from every grid. And how we'll create the restriction is to, we, we pick, 
first a uniform assignment to the Zepin instance, where we still have the odd constraints on all guys that are not blue. And on the blue guys, we'll have an even constraint. Okay, we pick an odd number of blue vertices, which means that the formula is satisfiable. So you can pick a uniform constraint for this formula. Okay. We now the charges are now even because we we said that the blue vertices have an even charge. We pretend that they have an even charge. Okay. Then we pick one vertex from these blue vertices so from every subscript. And then in a predefined manner, we could connect these. There is no randomness here. Anymore. Like if you pick these two vertices, then you have to pick this path connecting these. Okay. And you continue going, and then this will give you the subgrid that we will end up with the restriction. But, but we said that on these blue guys, these had an even constraint. So, so we are not quite there yet, right? Because we, we have to make sure that we have an odd constraint on these because the original variable had and the original formula had an odd constraint on these vertices. So, so what you do is so somehow you have to fix the parity on these centers. And, and what you do is you, you connect them by paths. Like you can think of this as a matching or, or by these claws where we connect three of them. And then we flip the assignment along these paths. And by flipping the assignments, we, we keep the parity at every inner vertex, but at the node, we'll flip the parity. So we'll actually have an odd parity now on these blue guys. So, so if we do this for all these and we flip it, then we have the correct parity on, on these green guys. And somehow we're just left with this smaller subgrid. So we can forget about everything and we're now left with this number. Does this make a bit of sense? Uh, was there any randomness there or was it determined? This is determinist. That's determinist. The only randomness is which we need gravity. No, this is also determinist. The only randomness is really row. You pick a uniform assignment there. It's really what? Sorry? Like, sorry, I didn't give it names. The the uniform assignment where you pretend the blue guys have even constraints. Uh, this is the only randomness that we're going to But also, which which of the blue guys you no. choose? No, yeah. you can choose some determinants. You have several blue guys, but you will always choose the same one. Ah, no, no, no. Ah. no, I mean, no, so, sorry. So, okay, let me be correct. So, so you have a few candidates on, on yeah. the diagonal. Yeah. You're going to pick a subset of those. Uh -huh. This is the first random choice, yeah. and the second random choice okay. is, is the assignment to everything except those where you have a new constraint. Okay. I didn't say this well. Okay, but then you, and then you choose the real center. And then that's you, also random. No, no, the real center you can think as deterministic once you know which of the blue guys you chose. Okay. Okay, so, so really the randomness comes from this which random guys? assignment and which blue guys are set to zero. Okay. Uh, sorry, Gilly, yes, Gilly, can I ask a question? So, uh, the uh, what do you do with uh, with those edges which are not uh, colored here on this picture? So they, they are completely randomly assigned. Or... The, the the gray edges. Gray gray edges. Yeah, those are assigned. So, so if we go back, so we start with picking these alive centers, and you choose, and you you pretend that these blue centers have an even Satan constraint now, like mm -hmm. uh, saying that an even number of mm -hmm. incident edges are, are set to one. And you're going to pick an odd number of blue vertices so that this is actually a satisfiable Satan mm -hmm. instance now. And you're going to pick a uniform random assignment of the satisfying assignment to this to the gray edges. Okay. Yes, to the gray edges. Okay, so this is what, what I thought. Okay. Yes. Good. And this is actually a global assignment, but then you're going you're going to keep a large part of it, but then the blue edges, on the blue edges, you're sort of going to undo it, and the, on the blue paths, you're going to undo this assignment and not use it, no, 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 and no. on the green path, you're going no, no, to no. flip it. No, 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 on, on the blue edges, you're going to use the assignment to, to either assign it the positive or the negative new variable. Mm -hmm. That's a new variable, it's not a yes. Boolean variable. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so right, like each blue edge is associated with with a variable now. 
on, on the smaller grid. And, and this each smaller edge here <laughs> had either a one or a zero on there. Mm -hmm. And you're, if it's a one, then you're going to pick the positive new variable. And if it's a zero, you're going to associate it with the negative mm -hmm. new variable. So that you really, independent of how you choose the variable on this path, the axioms on the, along the path are satisfied. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what I was asking, just to clarify, is, is if the following technical description is correct. First, we pick the blue centers in a random way, except I guess we want you know, to be reasonably sure to have the right number of blue centers inside every box. But let's not worry about that. The total number of blue centers is going to be all. Now I can think of inside my head, I sample a global assignment to because I haven't chosen which blue centers are going to be live yet, right? I just pick my blue centers now. Or are you already now, before even yeah. sampling, are you committing no, to no, the no. blue paths? No, no, no. In some sense, yes, but let us ignore this. Okay. So because the way I was thinking about now I sample like a global assignment, mm -hmm. which is satisfying. Yes. But it's I, I sample uniformly over satisfying assignments now. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. And then I'm gonna pick one blue guy in every box. Mm -hmm. Once I pick uh, like a neighboring pair of blue guys. The path you're going to hook them up with is like perfectly well defined and how and this path corresponds to a single variable, which alternately, you know, alternatively is positive and negative, depending on vertices along the path and your uniformly sampled global assignment. And now I've taken care. Now I hooked up all the blue guys. So things are fantastic. Now I need to worry about the glue guys that are not inside my smaller grid. And then we need to argue that maybe except for some failure probability, or maybe this will always work, I can hook up, hook them up three wise. And it sounded like you're still going to use your globally sampled assignment, except that on every green path, I just flip it. Yeah. Yes. OK. Exactly. So then it sounds a bit like I take my global assignment, I flip it on all green edges. On the blue edges, I sort of undo it and replace it by new variables in a systematic manner. Mm -hmm. And now this gives me the restriction. Exactly. Yes. Thank exactly. you. Yes. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense also, Pavel? Was that your like related to your question? Yes, yes, thanks. So yeah, this is what we'll have to work. And and this green hooking up will always work, or it's part of like things could go wrong, but that's part of the failure probability. Um, no, this always exists. It's either either uh, an edge or a, or a path. Uh, right, either it's an edge up here, we have an edge, or it's here. It's always a layer. Well, if I, if I, oh, because if you can hook them up by, yeah. wait, what, why, why are you sometimes hooking them by two and sometimes by three? Sorry. Because, I mean, this is, again, this is Johan's restriction. Yeah. So, so he could not prove that it only works with paths. So he also allowed cross. He, like, yeah, that's why. Like it almost you works. You choose any subgraph, but to show that every vertex does not degree, yes. right? And yes. he shows those two yes. and shows that it's exactly. possible. Yes. Oh, so okay. Like you just want to somehow, and they should be small components, but we'll get to that yeah. later. Yes. Okay. So uh, may I still ask because it's uh, not confusing me. So, uh, so the the first thing is uh, what uh, I, I, I thought that you first assign the. the Gray uh, edges, but uh, I would rather think that you should assign gray edges after you do something with the blue and green. What is you first assign the gray edges? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that was this question. Yes. When, when do you assign gray edges? Yes. Before you, before you do the blue one or after you assign, after you pick the blue ones and green ones.
you first picked this this assignment to the gray edges, and now either okay, you first pick the gray edges, and now there are different cases to consider. Either it's you're going to lie on the blue edge, which means you get replaced by the variable, either by the positive or the negative version, depending on. Okay, so so first you assign the gray edges, but then you unassign them and replace them by variables. Is that what you are doing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, on the blue edges and on the green edges, you're going to flip it. You 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 unassign and replace by variables. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Other questions? So again, just to see if we're because this is somehow the heart of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, blue centers are chosen randomly first. Then this means that if I and and I sort of mentally inside my head flip the parities of the blue vertices, mm -hmm. and since they're odd, it means now I flip the overall parity of the formula to even inside my head, so the formula is perfectly satisfiable. Mm -hmm. I sample a satisfying assignment for all edges in the whole universe, mm -hmm. or at least on the whole torus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I pick a blue center in every box and I hook them up in a predefined way that you already decided long ago. And on those blue paths, I now unassign, I will not use this randomly sampled assignment, but I will instead for every path, I will have a single variable that appears negated and unnegated so as to satisfy all intermediate vertices of degree two. Okay. Um, so the blue edges correspond to variables that will be live. The green edges will still be dead. They will still be assigned, but I will flip them. And this is because the centers at the endpoints of a green path, they actually need to have their parities odd. And I'm taking care of that by... Um, by actually flipping my total assignment from before on every green path. Exactly. And now in theory, it's like if I could just hook up all these non-chosen centers pairwise, I'll just get a lot of green paths, but somehow, and maybe this is even true, but we don't know how to prove it. So therefore we also allow slightly more complicated shapes, but the idea is still the same. Exactly. Yeah, like yeah. All, all we're going to use later on of these green parts is that they're of small size. That's all we use, and I mean that they flip the assignment correctly. But yeah, okay. Good. Now we talked so long. I'm sort of actually not sure anymore what's going to come next. Ah, yeah. So, so yeah. So so like of our sigma red. I want to describe the sigma. So so what we should think of it is really as a row. Which is the initial assignment to all edges, except that we have even constraints on the blue vertices. Plus, we have this matching along which we're going to flip the assignment. And then we're really left with these blue, no, like these purple guys, the chosen ones, which have the wrong parity, and everything else is satisfied. And we, the the, the paths are like predefined, so we know along which ones are going to stay alive. So, so we like for the later part of this talk, we really want to think of this restriction as a combination of this row plus pi. This is like a counting argument. You're going to use this to say that to count the number of possible restrictions. I mean, you're way ahead. No, like you're saying view it as this. It's, it's trying to understand why you want to view it as this, isn't it? I don't know how to answer this question. Okay. Maybe a second up. But should I think of both row? But row is random, but pi I should think of as deterministic. deterministic. Once row is chosen, pi is deterministic. Like we're only going to use the randomness from row in the later argument. There's no randomness. Okay. Okay. And just like to point out the key difference to, to, to Johann's previous proof is that previously 
the number of alive centers in each subsquare uh, was S, which is the resulting depth of the decision tree. And the key difference now is that we, we have to live with only log M, many of them. Mm -hmm. And this is a big difference to prove, or the only difference actually, mm -hmm. to the previous proof of Johan Oscar. Okay. So I didn't tell you, but that, as, as you correctly pointed out, like we want to choose the correct number of blue guys in each subsquare. And before it was roughly S, and we are going to use log L, mm -hmm. which causes some complications for the down below. But that is not what it is. This is roughly, not exactly like. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Yes. Just so understand that log N is much smaller than S. Yes. So you should think of S as logarithmic in the length of the proof squared. So, so it's like N to the one over 2D. Like, uh, yeah, it's polynomial in N, uh, one over D, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, if you think of constant depth, it, it's roughly, or yeah, I mean, it's N over one over D, some constant here, I don't know what it is. And do you require that the number of substanders in each log is the same, or it doesn't matter? Not exactly the same. So it's going to be uh, a log N, uh, some constant times this, and then you have one plus minus 0 0.1 times this. Like it's going to be in this interval. And what, what is important is that overall we have an odd number. Mm -hmm. And we have this many per subscore. So you might want to read out clearly what you say because this won't be visible. Just ah, okay, sorry. So, so S we can think of as like logarithmic in the length of the proof. So something like N to the some constant over D. And we will have the number of alive centers in, in each subsquare is going to be C log N uh, times one plus minus 0 0.1. So, so concent tightly concentrated around C times log N, many centers per subsquare. And the last question is, yes. uh, the candidates of these live centers are in the diagonal. Yes, they're they on are, diagonal. They are fixed to the mean, Yeah, I, I'll, uh, yeah. Uh, this one. So, so if, so, so, you your candidate ones are like on the diagonal equispaced and they're like in the middle so that you yeah yeah thank you okay but yeah so, so, so that, that's all for now just like some things uh yeah just to remind you what we prove <laughs> if you restrict vega proofs of lines to line size n and depth d of, of from satin over the torus then this requires length exponential in n over log m to the d. And some open problems. Can we prove super polynomial Frege lower bounds for the pigeonhole principle for, for like greater depth than log log m? Uh, and like, I think this one, this is the problem that people should be thinking about, in my opinion. Somehow like bounded depth Frege lower bounds for hard formulas, or at least formulas that we believe are hard, like, like, Num like how large is a click in a random graph or, or coloring, like is there a coloring of a graph? Can we prove like bounded depth regular bounds for this? Uh, I mean, also, and another question is somehow the random CNF formulas or so, but that seems to be much harder in my opinion. Like, I think coloring should be approachable. Maybe click is a bit optimistic, but random coloring is there. This should be doable. <laughs> And yeah, and then like one last annoying detail is that our lower bounds are like exponentially in n to the one over 2d minus one. Can you get rid of this too? Uh, this is, uh, uh, but yeah, th that's all from my side for the first hour. And in the second hour, we'll cover the single switching lemma, the proof, or I'll attempt to. And yeah, stick around if you're interested. Thank you, Kilian. Any questions from the audience before we take a break? Uh, just one question. So you, you say that uh, getting rid of this two uh, would be the final result, but uh, uh, n is, as I understand, the dimension of the of the grid or or, or on the torus. So in yes. fact, uh, uh, the upper bound is probably uh, smaller. Uh, I mean, larger than than n to one over the uh, so you think I'm too optimistic here? No, what I what I mean uh, is in a, in Boolean complexity we we have a, a low bound uh, exponential n to the one over b. Yes. 
Yes. Where n is the number of variables, but now the number of variables is actually square n square. Yes. Yeah, but, I mean, so, but you cannot hope to get an exponential in n to the one over two d lower bound. Like that is it. Sorry, sorry. Exponential in n to the two over d, like a factor of four improvement. Right. That I, I, I do not see happening, just because. I mean, the the, the mag, like you can prove, you can do a proof which only requires an XOR of size n, right? So okay, so so you do have an upper bound of this uh, I, of this size for 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 the grid. I do not have an upper bound, but but you believe it can be done? Yes, I'd be very surprised. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think the correct. This is. I think this is the correct answer. This okay. is. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank Kilian again.